Good morning and welcome to this webinar on distance learning, why hackers want to stop it and what you can do to protect it. My name is Mark Orchison and I'm the founder and managing director um, of the Nine on Flying Solo today. Um, so it's just uh, just me tomorrow. Have another webinar on TREMS too and I'll be joined by um, Heidi Ann O'Neill. We had a good number of over 60 people registered for this uh, this this webinar. So I will encourage you to um, uh, ask questions um, throughout the course of the of the webinar, um, and I'll do my best to answer them at the end. But if not, then you can always uh, send in questions at a later time. So we're talking today around around cybersecurity, and um, this this webinar was really um, influenced by an announcement that the NCSC had said earlier in um, in September, but also some of the activity that we have seen um, with distance learning and the attacks that are occurring on schools. And one thing I wanted to what I wanted to start with in terms of setting the scene is that um, cyber security protections within a school is like an iceberg and antivirus, which many people say they have to protect themselves is like the tip of the iceberg. But a lot of the attacks happen at everything below the iceberg and that's what antivirus can always see. So what we're talking about today is to really understand what the risks are and what's below the waterline in order for you to put in place protections so that you can protect your school, but also your school community. As I mentioned, um, the other webinars that are coming up, well, I hope you will also join us in uh, one tomorrow on Shrems 2. But then later on in October, we have a one about what are schools doing to protect themselves. And we'll be asking some other school uh, directors of IT to join and share their experiences. Um, which I hope will be more valuable to you in a, in, a, in a different context or different perspective from those who are um, at the coal face, so to speak. Um, I uh, have no shame in encouraging you to sign up through our, our app. Um, you have a 30-day free trial and you're all pre-registered um, to join the app. Um, you'll see on the bottom right-hand corner here, uh, uh, the URL in order to sign up um, and what you will find specifically uh, in related to the context of cybersecurity is our incident management tool and the incident management tool is something you can use um, uh, to evaluate the impact of a security incident like uh, a cybersecurity attack and then manage it through um, through to completion and I'll show you some aspects of that during the course of the of the webinar but the webinar is not going to focus on that um, and here's a Here's the, the home screen to give you some more context that it is a uh, very well built, built piece of technology. So as I mentioned, um, on, the, on the 17th of September, the National Cyber Security Centre, um, which is the UK cyber security uh, organisation, um, announced uh, to, to all education organisations within the UK that they're being targeted um, by, by cyber attackers. And what we need to be think of, thinking of here is that the, the motivations behind why education is, seems to be um, uh, hitting a bit of peak in terms of um, in terms of the attacks that are happening, <clears throat> and if you look at just economically around what's happening uh, across the world with um, uh, with COVID, there's sort of been a gold rush when it comes to distance learning. That schools have had to quickly enable distance learning um, and use technology um, in ways that they hadn't done before, and therefore that that economy, the, the economy of education in technology is growing where, where others, when it comes to uh, retail hospitality and other sort of hard businesses, um, is, is reducing. Therefore, the focus from a, a, a cyber criminal perspective is, is on the growing industries. Um, and uh, what you have to do as an, as an organization, when we go back to the law, and for those that joined me last, last week on the data, the role of the data protection officer, is to really understand what are the risks facing your organization and then put in place measures to protect that. And the definition here from um, the National Cyber Security Center is quite useful because essentially what risk management is, is, is forecasting what could happen, anticipating what the impact could be, and then looking to reduce the risk of, 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 that, of that instance that may occur. And we don't have to have a specific knowledge of the discipline of, of the risk. We don't need to have uh, the technical ins and outs of cybersecurity in this context, but we can forecast and we can look into the future of what what may what may be. And with the role of the data protection officer is to really understand what those risks and to support the organisation in managing those risks. 
So for those of you who did attend the, the, the workshop last, uh, last week, the focus was really in, in getting, a, getting a grasp for the data protection officer or lead to really understand and then support the organization in managing those risks. But then when an incident occurs, being there to support the organization to manage the incident. And, it's the, and, and at this, this moment in time, we know that one of the greatest risks to schools from a data protection perspective is the, uh, the risk of a cybersecurity attack. Therefore, if you're a data protection officer or data protection lead, your, your, your area of focus really at the moment should be how do we mitigate the impact? Because we know that we are likely to be attacked. The National Cybersecurity Center, who are part of the Five Eyes uh, security group, that includes the US and Australia, um, have all said that that education institutions are are being are being attacked. So when we look at the discipline of data protection, because essentially a cybersecurity attack is a could become a data breach. Um, the law is very clear in terms of the things that we should be doing. So as an organisation, you are there to understand the data and information you collect, where it goes, and depending on what type of school you are, you may have different systems. So a lot of our international schools are a lot more cloud based. Therefore, the data and information goes to different cloud providers and is transferred to third parties where those servers are located in the cloud. Where a lot of our UK-based schools, whilst they may rely upon Office 365, a lot, of the, a lot of the data and information is stored locally on hardware and servers and storage that is within a local server room. And you as, a, you as an organization need to understand you know, where your data is, is, is residing because the, the risks are slightly different. And they're slightly different if you're an Apple Mac based school as to whether you're a Windows based school. And when we look at cybersecurity, specifically from our point of view in supporting schools, the, the risks that we see with an Apple school with perhaps using Google are around the user and the data and the services that are available through the Apple device that are interconnected through the Apple device, like iCloud, Dropbox, and whatnot. Where with schools within the UK, the focus in terms of the risks are more on the infrastructure layer in terms of the hardware and the services that the school hosts locally and are perhaps facing the internet. Because actually as a, as a platform, we are seeing uh, uh, that um, from a, um, a Microsoft aspect, uh, let's say, they are less secure at a hardware layer than a, uh, an Apple device is at a hardware layer. But uh, an Apple device has access to far more data services and therefore the risks around the connection with those services. So as an organization, you're there to understand through your record of processing where data and information goes, what is the um, probability and impact of, of a data breach given your own architecture, and then ensure that you have the appropriate level of security and then communicate this. And within this slide, you'll see there's a variety of different uh, areas where the, where the word is risk is, is, is highlighted because under data protection law, that is what is required of you is to understand where your risks are. Um, and, and it's all, uh, in, in understanding where your risks are, is to reduce the risk of, of these things happening, um, which from a cybersecurity perspective could cause quite a lot of frustration for your, for your data subjects. And this is just setting the context. So when we're looking at the attacker profiles um, of those who are specifically targeting schools and education, um, you have these, uh, these five. So you have your recreational. Um, typically, we see uh, students within your school seeing how well they can, uh, uh, how far they can get. Um, you have the criminal, hacktivist, organized crime, and state-sponsored. Um, and I thought it'd be useful just to sort of give you an overview of the sort of state-sponsored type of actors and, and their, their activities. And there's a very useful report that I refer to a couple of times within this webinar, um, which is the Microsoft Digital Defense Report, September 2020. And you go to it, so it's, a, it's a very informative report in terms of where uh, the risks are, uh, are currently emanating from um, and uh, what you can start doing to protect yourselves. And if you focus here on um, uh, the uh, barium, which is uh, uh, essentially originating from 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 China. Um, essentially, with the within these within Iran, China, South Korea, North Korea, Russia, you have a number of state-sponsored actors specifically targeting different markets. In Barium, there you'll see that education is one of them. So K twelve education, um, and that, that is differentiated as you look across, um, for example, into into Russia, where you are where you have strontium. Um, where they are focused on higher education. But it's just interesting to see the different state actors that are all known and the different markets that they're specifically looking, looking to target. 
And within within this report, it came up with a very very useful um, uh, quote as the, as you as you can read here. And and cybercrime is a business, and you know if you have skills um, to apply uh, in terms of making money from cyber, you may do that. So if I'm a if I'm in London, which I am, and I have the skills for coding and development, and um, and also I could use those skills to hack um, IT systems, um, I'm unlikely to go to the latter to be hacking IT systems because my skills are very much in demand in London. I can get a very well paid job um, within fintech or any other other booming industries. Um, but if I'm in a in an African country, in a poor African country, but, I, but I've taught myself coding. Um, those jobs aren't that prevalent, but I can I can use my skills um, to make to make money through identifying organisations that uh, that have weak security protections, and then uh, seek to make money by uh, encrypting their data and asking for a ransom. Um, so so from a from a uh, an economic perspective those are the core drivers and at the moment uh, a key part of the economy is keeping schools open and you're doing that through distance learning now a lot of a lot of what we're seeing at the moment has been forecast in terms of going back to the very beginning we're looking to forecast the risks and the world economic forum um, both in 2018 2019 and 2020 have identified that data theft and fraud and also cyber attacks um, are some of the greatest risks in terms of facing um, uh, the, the 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 global e, uh, the global economy or um, or, or or countries, um, you can see from here. But they managed to miss that um, there may be a pandemic. Um, but that's all part and parcel of um, a forecast and risk. You're not gonna you're not gonna capture everything. Um, you're always gonna uh, forecast what what you what you really think is going to happen, um, while, rather than what actually is going to happen. Now this report was was um, run off yesterday, so um, you can go to uh, uh, part of the Microsoft website and you can run a report in terms of what industries are most at risk at this moment in time. And you can currently see that at the moment, 62% of um, uh, malware attacks are focused on education. Um, and the all other industries that you can see are significantly less so than education, which tells us that the majority of uh, uh, attackers are focusing on education organisations as a as a as a means to um, uh, uh, gain um, gain financial gain, and they do this because within um, within schools. Uh, there, you know, it's clearly been recognised that um, technical systems haven't been configured to provide protection to remote workers. The demographic within a school is people generally come into the school to be taught, and at the moment, um, schools need to mitigate that. Um, certainly, over the summer, uh, before the summer, and and starting back um, in the international uh, arena, um, uh, sometimes up to 25% of our current schools have up to 25% of staff and students outside of the current school building, either at home isolating or haven't been able to get back to their country. And within the within the UK, um, uh, schools before the summer had to set up distance learning programs. Um, and if they if they didn't, then they have to put in place the systems and the, the, the systems to allow distance learning to take place. They also recognise that in many cases, the overall configuration of systems in terms of devices um, that users have um, don't provide the level of protection that you may find within a corporate environment. So we find that in many schools that devices are configured to allow the teacher um, or the member of staff to have local administrator access. And if you have local administrator access to the device, that is a gateway that easily allows you to infiltrate the rest of the systems. The other thing that we've seen, and we saw this very, very early on, is human nature. So with the beginning of distance learning, um, there was like a rush um, by teachers and educators to find or create resources um, that would enable them to deliver a good teaching experience or learning experience whilst the student was at home, but also be in a position to share those, uh, those resources on, on different forums because you want to share best practice and you want to support other professionals, other teachers. 
but that in itself is giving rise to um, attackers then embedding uh, malware within resources that then get shared and downloaded and then used by uh, by teachers and not knowingly then they compromise their own their own device. We're seeing a lot of coercion. So we are seeing um, uh, both within the student body, but also with uh, teachers, um, more so now with students and, and, and teachers, where an attacker is profiling the schools that have distance learning programs, and then through social media or other means, are making connections and building trust with the students and the teachers to, to essentially share a payload with that user so that their device gets compromised. And then the attacker can start building um, a route into the, the architecture. We've had distraction of IT teams. So um, almost every IT, uh, every IT member of staff that we know within schools has been focused on distance learning and remote working, not only about making sure that people have devices, but that you've got Office 365 set up, but maybe Zoom, you've had issues with all these different types of configurations. And there hasn't been the time or the capacity within the organization to take a step back and to really look at where the security risks are. Therefore, the housekeeping has fallen behind. So not only do you have a booming industry in terms of the number of people who, um, uh, who are distance learning or distance working within education, but the security protections have actually reduced. That gives great opportunity for you as an attacker. And, and generally something that we've that we've seen is that there hasn't been a an investment by schools, certainly in school leadership or school boards, on the skills that's, that, 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 that are required to protect themselves when it comes to cybersecurity. And primarily that's been, been because, because the investment in cybersecurity doesn't necessarily always, well, doesn't provide an immediate benefit or tangible be benefit that you'll see within the classroom. It doesn't see something that's gonna immediately contribute towards um, the the education or the reputation reputational development of the school, um, therefore the investment in cybersecurity, specifically around the skills and the protections that are required, have fallen behind what is actually required and what I would say is the average for most other industries. So most other industries have caught up while education has actually um, uh, uh, fallen behind. And the tactics tactics here are very very simple. Um, as I said, the uh, cyber attacker sees that a school has money and essentially is then using uh, in one in one tactic, using social media um, to build up uh, trust between staff and students, delivering a payload. And then that payload um, finds its way all the way through to um, through to the, uh, the school systems. And these aren't just immediate. You know, you have malwares that are automated. So a malware that will just be out there and in the ether, um, and well, there'll be automated emails that 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 that, that get pushed out. But then you have um, human-operated ransomware, um, which is more specific, and this is more of what we're seeing, where um, a uh, an individual rather than just spamming uh, malware out there and hoping that you know with the volume that you'll find someone who has a weakness. Um, the attacker is being very, very specific in identifying specific schools and then using uh, malware over a period of time to increase their access into the school networks or access to the data. And it's not just at the first point in time that they get access to the network or get access to the data that then they will um, uh, uh, encrypt the data or take down services and demand um, a ransom. What they'll do generally speaking, is they'll, they'll build a number of different malwares within the organization. So they have the, the most amount of control. And then at a time that is, is advantageous, advantageous to themselves, they will then execute on the malware and at a time when the school is least prepared. Now, if we look at last October, um, in terms of the full break or half term, um, and within our international schools, we generally see the full break earlier than, than we see in, see in the UK schools. And what we saw was uh, as soon as the fall break started, we saw a significant increase in terms of cyber attacks happening in our international schools. But then later as we got through October, the same attack we then started to happen into the UK independence. So, so evidently that tells us that a time that's advantageous that attackers have identified is the October break and 
and uh, interestingly it was the same uh, the, the 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 year before and that's generally because then people are on holiday um, there is less awareness of what's of what's going or what's potentially going on there are less users that are potentially using their their own accounts and therefore if you already compromised an account you can um, you can use and that person's away um, you can start using their account for activity that they may not necessarily be aware of had they actually been um, uh, been um, uh, in, in school. And then you have this increase into special category data. And what I'm trying to do here is sort of emphasize um, a number of different tactics um, with people spread around the world. Um, so starting here on the, on the far, far left-hand corner, you have your attacker with Facebook. And this person's using essentially an Apple device and services. Um, and the, uh, the 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 teacher has been identified because their 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 username and their passwords had been compromised through things like Equifax. But that teacher also uses services such as Dropbox on their own device for for storing and sharing um, data associated with 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 that school. Um, but there is there is no management of that device by the school um, because it's been set up uh, like a personal device because it's an Apple device. And in, in, in instance within within this within this way, the attacker has complete access to the services associated with that Apple device because the Apple device has been set up. It's the entire designed for for ease of use in terms of the sharing of data across the uh, across the different services that are, that are connected to it. In the in the uh, in the top left, you have uh, uh, an individual teacher that's been profiled on LinkedIn, but also their their use of TikTok in terms of their profile that allows an entry point in terms of the building of trust into into their into their devices. And in the right hand corner, you have the typical phishing example um, uh, through through email. So so whilst these are known tactics, what we'll see is the prevalence of them is increasing, and there's not there's not one specific tactic that is more successful than than the other. Um, it's more so that the attacker understands there's a school with a distance learning program and is using a variety of different attacks um, to, to, to gain access. Now, one of the things what we see here is, um, uh, is an interesting uh, diagram that just sort of shows um, the movement of, a, um, of an attacker through an initial, um, through initial access, um, uh, gaining credentials all the way through to um, the delivery of a, of a, of a payload. And, and you need to recognize that as soon as someone has access through some sort of uh, system or service or, or device, when they come into the network of your school, they can do a scan of the school and then they can find out um, uh, more devices that are within the, the network or on the service. Um, and they can then attack those in terms of um, the, the system and in, and in many cases, what you will find this, what you've got here is credentials in plain text, is you will find that um, when you've accessed the school system, whilst you may feel that everything's protected, everything, everything has a password, the way that, that passwords are stored on the device, such as a network switch or a server, um, they're not stored in an encrypted way, or they're encrypt, encrypted in a way that can be easily broken. So soon, as soon as someone comes, has access to the network, there are a multitude of, of different areas that an antivirus won't pick up where there where there are lack of protections, but a uh, an attacker can can easily can easily compromise um, those different devices. And given the example of a um, going back to the iceberg, um, the iceberg remember the antivirus just does the, does the top scanning. Um, at the bottom, every component of a of a network architecture, whether it be a wireless access point whether it be a server and on the server, there's a network card that allows remote access. Each of those have individual vulnerabilities that need to be managed and maintained because if they're not managed and maintained, then there's an access route into the hardware. And when the hardware is compromised, it doesn't matter what operating system is sat on top of it, whether it be um, a, ser a, a master server or whether it's a, a SQL database. Um, as soon as the server is actually compromised through the access of a, of a piece of hardware because the firmware has not been updated, um, the the antivirus is never going to never going to pick up on 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 that intrusion into the network. There are other tools that are required or other protections. So as an organisation, you're looking to understand, okay, what are the entry points from that initial access because we have to shut those down in order to protect us 
from the rest of things and the lateral movement of the attacker within within the um, within the network because the attacker's job is to gain as much leverage as they can while they're in in your network so and then hit you at the most advantage, advantageous point in time for them to extract the maximum amount of money now when you have an incident um, the going back to the data protection officer's role is there to support the organization sort of understand what the impact's going to be and then on and then be able to uh, manage that so you reduce the the impact and what you've just got here is an example of our instant management framework within the app that allows you to go through a triage go through an assessment and also manage the risk um, so that you can collectively bring together your IT team any cyber professionals such as nine and your leadership to then determine what the impact of this cyber instance is likely to be and then be able to manage it and and the risks that you're looking looking to determine um, when you're going through the exercise of evaluating the type of incident that's taking place are these down the left hand side that you've seen many times but on the right hand side you're then trying to evaluate what the impact's going to be in terms of physical material or non-material so that you can effectively manage that and one of the important things that as a school should be thinking thinking to do and i touched upon this last week is is to road test how you would respond to this type of cyber attack because um i, I would go as far as to suggest that if there's 50 people on this call or 50 schools that certainly within the next 12 months i'd say at least at least 20% uh, of you are going, to, are going to come across some form of cyber attack or cyber incident that's going to be um, uh, going, to, going to require management. And evidently, um, if you have that type of incident, you have the short term impact and the longer term impact with the shorter term being how do you manage the cyber security attack? What is the extent in terms of the um, uh, the attacker and where, how many systems have they compromised and how do we recover and we, do we recall do we restore the service to, to limit that operational disruption um, and in thinking about the types of attack that that can take place you can start putting in place plans or thinking about what your plans would be uh, to manage that short-term pain but also in terms of the, the longer term the longer term impact um, I, I'd go as far to say that the that, that COVID-19 is going to be a game changer when it comes to the um, implementation of data protection law, because in the rush in order to um, to get systems and services working, so new things like distance learning, there has been a range of different uh, holes and that, that have been missed um, for the very nature of that the resource or the, or the skills haven't been there. And um, now is the time to retrospectively go back and ensure that any sticking plasters that you had have been mitigated because you you will see certainly in the next few years um, uh, a significant increase in the number of fines and dissuasive action for organizations that haven't been taking security as seriously as data protection law would like them to do so regardless to see regardless to whether at the time of having to move to uh, a distance learning program um, it was practical to uh, to put in place these security measures because data protection law would say, well, you should have forecast that beforehand and those security measures should already have been thought about. So so at this moment in time, you can go back retrospectively and put in place those protections, but I will see a significant number of fines. <clears throat> You're also likely to see potential litigation from data subjects. Um, we're seeing that more and more within the US and they've not necessarily updated all their data protection laws. But within the EU and in within jurisdictions that are reflecting the GDPR, there is a specific legal remedy where the individuals can take litigation against data, uh, against the organization. And I, I'm, I'm going to be very interested to see what happens um, around uh, not necessarily a cyber breach, but there's a whole issue with the IB and automated decision making of grades um, uh, that then has an influence on you know, if I've been graded by a computer and my grade is a lot lower um then uh, that may affect my uh, my chances in life around a career so we're, I, i'm looking looking to see or i'm forecasting that the the instance that's happened with ib and automated decision making is going to give rise significant amount of litigation from data subjects directly at schools and um and ib and then the other thing that you have in terms of longer longer term damage is, is damage to your reputation and it's not just schools that are being targeted so we have attacks here in terms of blackboard and some of you may have been affected by this and essentially what happened in Blackboard was in May, they were targeted by a ransomware um, and they they didn't notify anyone until um, the 16th of July. 
So uh, scores here have been indirectly compromised because they've shared the data and information of their data subjects with Blackboard, and then Blackboard itself has been targeted and data has been compromised. But what we found here with the Blackboard um, uh, attack is that Blackboard couldn't then tell the schools what data was compromised. Um, and they were quite clear in saying that they paid the cyber attacker. Um, so that's just going to encourage more cyber attackers to compromise or seek to compromise not only providers of ed tech te and, uh, and education technology ed tech, but also directly target schools because they know they have money and they know that they're willing to pay to mitigate the operational impact on their distance learning programs. Um, here with Blackboard and going back to the very basics of data protection law, or Blackboard are saying that, well, it's gonna take a lot of time for you to sort this out and yeah, they, they, there you go. But when it comes back to liability, the liability still sits with the school. So in this type of attack, although it's not necessarily direct on the school, there is a liability there for the school to have determined that Blackboard was a provider that 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 um, uh, or third party that provides the relevant types of protections um, for the data it's processed. But in mo most cases, when we spoke to our schools about their evaluation of Blackboard, there hadn't been an evaluation that had taken place in terms of whether they were providing the right protections of the data that they were storing within their cloud-based systems. So it's another component of something that 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 you need to be aware of. Moving on to the areas of protections, and if you have any questions, then do uh, start putting those in, because um, we're, we're, we're coming to sort of the end or the next phase. Um, in terms of the frameworks and standards that are available, there are quite simple things that you as an organization, as a school, can start to do to protect yourselves. And the same, many of you will be familiar with the 10 steps to cybersecurity that, 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 that we have often um, shown or trained schools on, because this is a very simple way for school leadership um, those who aren't technically minded to understand what the risks are, but also to understand what their obligations are in association with the law. We then have more complex um, uh, and, and sort of in-depth frameworks, such as the NIST Cybersecurity and ISO 27001. But in short, there are many, many frameworks that you as a school could follow um, to, to increase your level, level of security, given the data that you process, the systems that you use, and the devices that your end users use. And there's no necessarily right one. It's picking one that's most comfortable that's most comfortable for yourselves in order to move yourselves forward. And fundamentally, they, you know, they all look at the same thing. So they're not looking at anything too different. They just take a different take on it, or they have a specific nuance in terms of they are a specific they are sector focused. So they're either health or finance or, or, or whatnot. There's not one specifically that looks at education, um, but they look at those core points and. I've spoken about many of those uh, in, in context of um, your circumstances today. And this is the 10 steps to cybersecurity, if you weren't familiar with it. Um, and it's quite straightforward for you to, uh, for you to pick up this, um, this PDF to understand what you need to be doing. And in understanding your overall cybersecurity posture, there are a number of things that you can focus on. Now, at a strategic level, um, there, is this, there is this emerging st strategy calling, calling, called the zero trust strategy. And, and what this sets out is that any device, any user access level, um, you, you start off with a with, with, with your starting point is zero trust. They have, they have access, essentially they have access to nothing. So the service, so that may be when you say a service, the uh, the if you if you are looking to bring in a third party platform, it could be an admissions platform, it could be HR, um, you'll start to go off, well, we're not sharing any data with them because we have a zero trust strategy. Um, and then we are only sharing the data that's absolutely required with that platform in order for the order in order for the admission system to work. Um, and that sort of correlates with this principle of data minimization that's under data protection law, which is you only processing the the the, uh, the, the, the minimal amount of data that you're required to in order to, for example, do the admissions process. Um, generally, what we speak, what, what, what we advise our clients to start with is this overall security and systems assessment of their infrastructure and then doing the same but of their cloud based platforms. Now, some of our schools start with, well, we need to do a, um, a penetration test, a cyber penetration test to see whether we can be hacked. Now, that is not the starting point in, in our view for protecting yourselves because a pen test all it's doing is scanning your network and working the easiest route through to gain uh, overall control of your systems um, or your data or your domain. 
whereas a security and systems assessment looks at everything, looks at the, the whole playing field, the whole attack surface of your devices, of your users, of your systems to work out your general level of protection, but where your risks are. So then you can focus your, your, your efforts in, uh, in securing your, uh, your systems that are, that are most at risk or your users that are uh, most at risk before you get to the point of actually doing a pen test. So the whole idea is like understanding your, the, the, how your areas of weakness and then reinforcing those areas of weakness with defenses. And then essentially you're going to uh, attack those defenses through a pen test, but only when you've done those first two, those, those first two um, uh, steps. And essentially by doing that, you'll understand your most critical and high risk vulnerabilities um, and be able to manage your risks. Um, in terms of you know, raising awareness, like 70% of, of security um, incidents when it comes to cybersecurity, the entry point is through your users. And I've tried to emphasize that in those sort of diagrams that I showed you in terms of how we are seeing attackers uh, gain access into the systems and, and data within a school. And we've developed this, uh, this game called Go Fish, and some of you know our clients on the school have played it. Um, uh, Shamila, after this, we will be reaching out to all of you. And if you want to have a pack of this uh, this card game, you can play this in about 20 to 30 minutes with your leadership team, and they will very quickly understand what cybersecurity is all about without having to be technically aware of uh, how to update firmware on a network card in a server. Um, they will get they will they will gain the grasp of what what are the risks and what protections are required. Um, so as you can see here, you can just see here it's just uh, some some workings out of one of our clients. But that's the card game, and we have plenty of those. Um, we can post those out to you, or alternatively, they're available in PDF on our on our website. And when we come, when we go back to what is a security and systems assessment, um, what you see here is the output from one of ours. So we will go into a school. Um, we will do a, a vulnerability assessment. We do a thousand point check um, across all systems and, and security. And that gives you a barometer in terms of the levels of protection um, within the school. But you as an IT team, it gives you a complete overview about where you need to be focusing your time and your resources to, uh, to protect the data, information and users within your school. And then from a leadership perspective, it's very easy to understand just, just from a geographically where the risks are, because um, if, it's, uh, if it's red or um, then, it, then obviously it needs uh, a greater level of protection and a greater level of urgency. With this framework, we have then also aligned it back to the um, National Cybersecurity 10 steps to, to, to cybersecurity, but also the Cyber Essential Certification. So Cyber Essential Certification in, in the UK as recognized internationally is a, is a, a certification to that that recognizes the level of protections you have afforded to your systems and services and users and devices within within your within your organization so we can benchmark the level of compliance against that but then also support in terms of um, achieving that level of compliance if you wanted to do so if you didn't some of our some of our schools do this each year just to demonstrate their level of progression or to work out the level of resources that's required to support them so overall, um, in terms of uh, the support from Nine, um, hopefully it's given you some food for thought in terms of uh, the the economics of um, why attackers are targeting schools. Um, our our app not only provides you with the framework around um, uh, uh, managing an incident, but also there's a lot of resources in there in terms of um, the types of cybersecurity incidents that you could manage and what you what you need to do. Um, should should one occur? So if one if one does occur, if you do have a security incident and you haven't signed up for the trial, then I'd certainly uh, suggest you, you you use the trial because you can use our app to manage your your incidents. Um, for all schools in October, as we said, uh, October is the is the month where we are seeing um, the greatest number of cyber attacks uh, within within our schools historically, but also it's Cyber Security Month, so we are uh, offering all the schools that take the license for our app either a free vulnerability assessment of your school systems and services or a cloud security review or office 365 or, or Google um, and you can um, you can you can you can receive that those those free assessments by uh, subscribing to um, to the to the app um, or if you just wanted some some um, some training for your leadership um, we can provide one hour free training for your leadership team 
on uh, data protection and in cybersecurity, and anything that you've seen in terms of today, all the other webinars, all the webinar tomorrow in Shrems 2, we can pull together as a tailored package of professional development to support your leadership in, in understanding what the risks are, but also by educating it then enables them to act in terms of um, uh, allocating the, the level resources. Um, and lastly, we've, we undertake obviously the comprehensive security and systems assessment that I've shown you. And also uh, quite often we, we can provide the cyber incident response um, if you have a breach um, and you need some um, additional support. So I'm just seeing whether there's any, um, uh, any questions here. Um, and I don't think we've um, uh, we've got too many. Um, I think Brian, uh, sorry, uh, Bridin, um, in terms of I'd, I'd, I'd agree, um, tiered access for all um, systems, services, and um, and devices is something that uh, that you should have in place um, when it comes to the management of your IT systems. Um, your IT team should have two two logins. They should have a login which is their name for their own email account, but their the, the, the account that they use um, to administer the different systems and services um, in terms of the servers or the applications should be an entirely different um, an account to the one that they have um, um, individually themselves. And that systems and services account really shouldn't have access to email because email is one way that those types of accounts can be, can be compromised. So I hope you all have enjoyed the uh, the webinar um, today. We uh, have the Shrems 2 webinar tomorrow. Um, the team will be in contact with you should you have any uh, any questions um, or uh, would like a copy of the uh, the Go Fish game. And um, as always, if you have any questions, um, ultimately many of you should have my my details, and I'll be happy to to answer those directly or or jump on a call. So um, thank you very much for your time, and uh, hopefully you'll be able to join us tomorrow for Shrems 2. Thank you.